everyone and welcome to Global Outlook. How do you counter violent extremism and make sure young people aren't attracted to such groups as ISIS or Boko Haram? Our guest today is a thought leader who uses insight gleaned from data to locate and assist vulnerable communities. Mina Chang is the CEO of Linking the World, a humanitarian group dedicated to helping children and families in developing countries, conflict and disaster zones. Mina, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, so one, one thing you do is um, to, set, you, to combat um, extreme or violent extremism, you believe in education. Is that the key to doing, to doing that? Well, education is the key to providing opportunities later in life, for okay. sure. But part of our work in countering violent extremism and the spread of the violent ideology is to identify communities that are vulnerable. Okay. So they're impoverished and they're being exploited by these groups so that they, these groups can further their agenda. So they're tackling areas that are um, lack of education, lack of jobs, lack right. of good governance, and they're filling these security vacuums, these power vacuums, and providing their alternative narrative of what the world should be like. They're providing education, they're providing food. And so the way that we believe we're tackling the spread mm -hmm. of violent extremism is to get ahead of that and provide a standardized education and and then also food and clothing, the basics too? Yes, we work with other organizations mm -hmm. that are already out there doing great development work and we collaborate to make sure that we're tackling these issues comprehensively. Okay. I think going into a community with just one solution, it's not sustainable. You can't just, um, you know, you can't just focus on one part of a, a mm -hmm. problem and think that the whole community is going to transform. And one thing you do in your organization is you use data to figure out what the best solution is. Tell me how you do that. Well, we've discovered through our use of technologies mm -hmm. that big data is an incredible tool that's being used by everyone from Facebook to Google mm -hmm. to investment companies to understanding human behavior mm -hmm. and to understand trends and measure things like human sentiment. So we identified a way to take big data and understand how it can show us where in the world are the most vulnerable spots. And that's where you concentrate your resources? Yes. So where are those spots? Well, they're not <laughs> the places that are in the news right now. So okay. the places that we hear in the news, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it's um, a bit too late. But the data can show us where the next potential hotspots are. They're uh, fragile states. Okay. They're areas that are strategically of importance to these groups mm -hmm. to win mm -hmm. either people or territory to mm -hmm. legitimize their cause or to recruit or to use as proxies for their underlying businesses like human trafficking, drug trafficking. And uh, we identify those areas and then the data also helps us identify the root causes of instability in that area. So it can help us understand what are the drivers is it lack of good governance? Is it security? Is it access to markets? Is it agriculture, education? Is it the same drivers in each area generally? It it's starts with po It's different. It doesn't all stem from Yes, poverty I think is a symptom. Right. It's, um, it's, a, it's actually a symptom. It's not just the cause of okay. the problems. Mm -hmm. the, the poverty is caused by a lot of corruption within mm -hmm. government. When a state can't respond and meet the needs of local people, there's resentment and that disenfranchisement and feeling of margin marginalization, um, those sentiments are being tapped into by these extremist groups. So where are these vulnerable spots now that you're, that you're marked? Uh, you know, Africa, I would say, in a broad stroke, is a place that we need to be looking at now. You know, okay. we've been focusing on Africa as a place of, yes, there's, there are a lot of impoverished areas in mm -hmm. Africa that we need to focus on, but now we see that these extremist groups are moving their operations and their recruiting in these areas because right now the world's attention is in the Middle East and in places like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so right now, uh, Africa is ripe for Are you the only the NGO that uses big data like this to, to shape your strategy? Uh, as I, as I know of, we're the only organization that uses big data to help shape the programming. Mm -hmm. Now, there are organizations that use that, the analytics, to shape their programming and implement on the ground. I told you about Nuru yes. International uh -huh. ahead yes. of this, and 
and they're doing that. Um, we're creating pilot programs so that we can show our government the importance of using data to make better informed choices when we're making these programs. Let's take a look at some pictures you brought with you of your work around the world, okay? okay? So here you are in Time Magazine, congratulations. <laughs> Let's tell me about this cover and how this came to be. Well, uh, we started using drone technology in disaster response, uh -huh. and so that was when the whole talk of how is technology being used to save lives in disaster response scenarios mm -hmm. are being used. And, um, I suppose I brought some attention to that. The UN has now adopted that and many organizations are using Were you using the first that. one to use drones? No, we weren't, but we were the first organization to be awarded an FAA exemption uh -huh. that allows us to fly drones in U.S. airspace. That's great. And so we have some more pictures coming up. Okay, where is this now? Uh, this was in Iraq. Uh -huh. This was in Doha, which is uh, an area in northern Iraq at a refugee camp. And I got to meet many of the children there that were just recently rescued from ISIS captivity. Mm. They're receiving trauma therapy, education, and reintegration into society over the next few years. This is in Afghanistan. I'm sitting with women in our program. They're uh, living in hiding, essentially. So um, I can only say that they're right outside of the Kabul area, but they Why fled. are they hiding, Mina? They're hiding because they have taken their children and fled um, their husbands and families that were abusive or Taliban sympathizers. Okay. And uh, they want to provide education for their children. They want to work. And so they've banded together. They're supporting one another. And they have um, taken the opportunity that all of these military and diplomatic gains have given the space for to go and get jobs. Mm -hmm. But now they're a bit worried that we're kind of retracting and they're going to be put in harm's way. So I'll be in Afghanistan in a week just to wow. work on this issue. Okay, and we have more pictures coming up. This is in uh, Somalia. These are young girls in, in a school in Somalia in an area where um, children were just recently allowed to go into school. Oh. And this school has more girls than boys. <laughs> and Yay. they sang songs for me, they welcomed me. They had a whole welcoming parade, which was very humbling. Oh. But they were just full of joy. And it was incredible to see because right outside of the school, just driving in, you hear gunfire. Oh my goodness. Um, that week while I was there, there were two parliament members that were assassinated right on the street. So it's a very dangerous uh, environment. I, I would say that Somalia in, in Mogadishu, mm -hmm. it's more dangerous to walk around on the streets than it is in Iraq or Afghanistan right now. So, uh, well, how do you deal with the benefits and the risks? Benefits versus risks, because you are a mom too. You yes. have an 11 year old, I understand. Um, when do you decide, no, it's too dangerous to go in because I'm a mom or I need to go for my work? Well, like any war reporter or a practitioner will say, you can't really get a pulse of what's happening on the ground unless you're there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do have to be there, but I try to limit to be responsible to, because my first and foremost job is to be a mom, a right. mom that's around. Right. But, you know, I had the benefit of getting a good example set by my parents. My mm -hmm. parents were officers in the Salvation Army, mm -hmm. so they were practitioners seven times, 17 times over than what I was doing. And I got to see how they led life, you know. Mm -hmm. They took chances too. They were going into these places to serve people who are in most desperate need that don't get the help because yes, it is dangerous to go in there. But it subconsciously, and I hope I'm doing this to my daughter, gives her permission, it gave me permission to take risks, mm -hmm. to go after what I feel that my passions and my calling in life is. And to have faith that God will protect you well, in those places Faith too, is a right? huge <laughs> element of that. Yeah. But yeah. also, when you go to these places and you see and you meet mothers, mm -hmm. you see fathers and mothers and families, they're living in these places and surviving in these mm -hmm. places. I get to leave. I get to yeah. have security. I get to plan ahead. Um, the families that are living there, they don't have that choice. They have no idea when they're going to be able to go back home or what their situation is going to be like looking towards the future. Um, we'll be right back. We need to take a little break, but don't go away. We'll be back with more from Mina Chang, a thought leader who is making a difference in war-torn countries. Stay with us. Life is made of moments. Family. A drunk driver could take it all away. Keep your family safe on the road, because after all, nothing is more beautiful. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Keep your family safe. We've been 
talking with Mina Chang, CEO of Linking the World, a humanitarian group that believes every single child attains the right to survival, development, dignity, protection, and participation. Mina, uh, earlier we were talking about how you go to these different uh, developing countries or countries that have, that are sort of fragile in terms of recruiting the youth and, you know, they might be attracted to these groups. What do you do and what do you do differently than other groups to help these young people? Well, um, first, I'd like to say that, you know, when you read out our mission statement, it's so easy to look at a mission statement and glaze over uh, how that's applied to the work on the mm -hmm. ground. And though those words might sound utopian, it's very pragmatic. The cost of um, responding to a disaster, responding after a war, is very expensive. And mm -hmm. it takes a fraction of that to go in and be proactive. And that's what we're doing. Okay. We're taking programs, we're identifying communities that are unstable, mm -hmm. identifying what the root drivers of instability are, and going in and proactively building resiliency in these communities. Because By educating them. Through, education is a major component of it, okay. but it's not the only component because every community is different. You have to take the context of that instability and take into consideration the, the religious, the socioeconomic, the political, and the geopolitical context of mm -hmm. why that area is so unstable. And even climate change. There are areas that are perfectly fine, and then a drought hits, and right. the community becomes fractured. But the people who are living in these communities they are the solution, they know what the solutions are, they're ready and they're already at work. We go in and provide the support system and the information through the data and the connectivity to the other actors that they need to continue their work. And that's through connecting them with uh, military, diplomatic and other civil society organizations as well as other development organizations that can meet the needs of other elements that are missing. So if, an, if a community is already addressing issues of um, food insecurity mm -hmm. or maybe uh, lack of access to water but they need someone to come in and institutionalize a school then we can help bring in an educational institution. So the name of your organization linking the world you are literally linking like a yes, network these groups right to all these other different groups that could help them and, and yes. give them the support they need yes. and you've changed the, the you've actually refounded linking the world. Tell me yes. about that, how it was before and how you've changed it. Yes, and why. Um, it's completely different from when it was first founded, other than the name. And the name is appropriate because the approach is still the same. It's the <clears throat> understanding that we live in an interconnected world right. and that there are no zero sum games. What happens on the other side mm -hmm. of the world affects us here at home, and that we have to be engaged globally and that we have to serve one another because it, we have a shared humanity. It was founded in what year? It was founded in 97 okay. out of South Korea. And then you came. And they did incredible work. They did, uh, they built schools, hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, orphanages. They, we did a lot of disaster response. When I came in, we were doing a lot and ramped up our disaster response operations. And that's when I started to realize that a lot of these places, we were coming in a bit too late. Once a disaster or a mm -hmm. war hits, mm -hmm. um, the reconstruction efforts, the, it, the rehabilitation, the reconciliation that must occur, it's a lot of work. And that's when a lot of those sentiments of discouragement can come in. And um, I've always been looking to be innovative in ways. Mm -hmm. So we tried to even incorporate drone technology mm -hmm. to say, well, why don't we incorporate the newest technologies and capabilities to address you know, the issues today? Mm -hmm. Through that is how we learned about data because through the drones, it collects a lot of imagery, remote sensing, and I asked, well, what happens to this data? And you right. started to see all these data sets that are open source, mm -hmm. it's very inexpensive, and you, you use it to analyze the areas that you're working in. So you, <coughs> you're the one who actually does the analyze? No, not at all. No? <laughs> <laughs> we have incredible data scientists. Uh -huh. um, you know, we have incredible data scientists, and we have guys that have studied development. They also understand the intersection of military and civilian mm -hmm. action in these areas. They understand uh, how diplomacy works. They understand how states are built and how resiliency is built. And so it takes all of that kind of understanding to provide a solution that's sustainable. This is a very different approach of helping someone else out. You know, we think of 
like the Red Cross. You donate money and they get actual bundles of food or, or bandages or mm -hmm. medical supplies, mm -hmm. but you're not doing that. You said you're proactive instead of reactive yes. to a disaster, right? Yes, and there needs to be organizations like the Red Cross, Mercy mm -hmm. Corps, that uh, have the programs that they do. There's just a gap. There's, um, you know, there are a lot of organizations, too, that do handouts. Mm -hmm. So you see a need, you give them stuff, and you leave. Right. And many times there are some devastating unintended consequences. Sometimes you disrupt the local markets, or you might strip people of dignity just by giving food away, or you might be disrupting um, a way of mm -hmm. life, like we've seen with nomadic tribes in sub-Saharan Africa by having them live in one camp, for example. Right. So there are unintended consequences. Instead of giving handouts, we decided we wanted to work with the locals to give a hand up. Mm -hmm. We know that as long as they get that little nudge and inf access to information, then how difficult they are the is solution. it to work with all the local governments? The local governments. <laughs> That's um, a challenge. There is a balance because uh -huh. we come in as a neutral organization. We're a non-government organization, right. but we're based out of the United States. We're working to provide development solutions in the context of national and global security, mm -hmm. and so that can mean different things to someone from another country. Um, so it's a, it's a dance mm -hmm. that we play, but it's wonderful because I get to hear and understand directly from them what it is that they see for their country and for their people, their perspective. Mm -hmm. Then I get to understand and hear um, the sentiments from the ground, from a mother, from a child, and what their hopes and dreams are for their country and for their future. And sometimes you see the shared interest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can see where the disconnect is happening. And, and when you see that disconnect, the competing interests, how do you handle that as an NGO? Well, as an NGO, you know, we all, that's something that you have to factor into program mm -hmm. design. Part of what we're doing is a lot of advocacy work mm -hmm. on the Hill in D.C. to help legislators and our uh, government officials understand that we have to restructure the way that we provide development solutions internationally. Hand in hand with military efforts and diplomatic mm -hmm. efforts, all of the billions of dollars that are spent in development aid has to be coordinated with what we're doing to foster peace and stability around the world. Do you ever get discouraged when you look at the big picture because it's a huge problem and what you're trying to tackle, you know, or is it just like, no, I see it, I have a clear vision. What is it like for you as a person? I did get to a point, I have to say, where I wanted to um, give up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we all get to a place in our careers where we wonder, is this where I'm going to really make an impact in my life? And it was really because I started to feel the sense of cynicism mm -hmm. around me people said, why aren't we focusing on issues here in our own backyard? We do. We have a lot of problems here. Why are we focusing on places in like Iraq, Afghanistan, and right. middle of nowhere Africa, <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa? Right. And I saw, I saw that, you know, that was a huge threat to our way of life. Mm -hmm. What are we fighting for? What are we preserving here, even in our own community, if we're not going to take care of one another and understand that we are interconnected and that what's happening in the world is affecting us directly here at home. And what got me recharged was the understanding that organizations, they also saw that. And they are pushing mm -hmm. to change, transform the way that we're providing development services, humanitarian aid and service to other people in the world. And so we, we are banding together. We are encouraging one another. But you know, uh, to move laws and processes and the U.S. government, it takes a lot it of takes time. So long. It takes a lot of voices. And so it's, it's an effort that I feel like I'm part of a new team. Mm -hmm. And so you I'm have a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm energized energy. now. So you don't feel discouraged about it at all, even though it may take a long time to get things accomplished. It, it, it's a lot of work, but uh, actually, some of these trips internationally help me get recharged. It you reminds you of what you're, what you're working towards. When you're looking at and meeting a mother who's just like you and I, and, mm -hmm. or meeting a child that's just like our children, mm -hmm. and um, you see that they are just like us, I hope that somebody would fight for me and my child the way that, you know, that our community wants to for them. Where did this come from, this desire to help other people? I know you said your parents were in the Salvation Army, mm -hmm. and they're from Korea, is that right? Yes. Is that why you Korea. were interested in the Korean, you know, because Slinking the World is originally a Korean organization? Yes, it was founded in uh, South Korea, and that's a success story. You know, South Korea went from one of the poorest countries in the world mm -hmm. to now, I think, the 11th or 12th largest economy, contributing to the world with incredible right. brands and technologies. And you look at 
what's happened in one generation and what's possible because of the right approach to development. And then you look at um, what hasn't worked in lots of places, in lots of African countries or in the Middle East. Um, so it was founded by groups of people in South Korea that understood that, hey, we need to approach development in other mm -hmm. countries the way that it was approached in South Korea. But when you were little, did you, did you look at these you know, groups helping others and go, that's what I want to do and I get older, that's the, you know, or what? Where did the um, strive come from? I would say from? that I was a recipient. I was a recipient of these types of programs. Mm -hmm. My parents, uh, essentially being refugees themselves and then becoming officers in the Salvation Army. I grew up in these programs. I went to school with the very children that are in the Salvation Army. Okay. I, um, I lived in the, in the community centers, the homeless shelters with them. And uh, not only am I a product of it, they're my friends. I see them, they're all adults now and they're thriving. They're giving back to their communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was instilled in me that, you know, the, my friends growing up, by the way, when they were living in these impoverished situations, they didn't see themselves as victims. Right. They saw themselves as, yes, this is my situation, but I'm going to overcome it and I'm going to help other people because of it. So I think that's where it was instilled. That can-do attitude. If somebody wants to help out, they can go to your website, Linking yes, the World, absolutely. and find out what they can do. Yes. Great. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank Dana. you for having me. Coming up next, we'll hear the powerful sounds of the 10th Annual Aquaba Dance and Drum Festival. Stay with us. children struggles with hunger in America. Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. HCC recently enjoyed three days of drumming and dancing, exploring and sharing the ancient traditions of African dance with master teachers and artists from around the world. Here's a look at some highlights from the 10th Annual Aquaba Dance and Drum Festival that took place at the Performing Arts Center at our HCC Northwest Spring Branch campus. <laughs> Tonight, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of having the Aquaba Dance and Drum Festival here at Houston Community College's Northwest Spring Branch Campus. Aquaba means welcome, and the language is tree, which is spelled T-W-I, which is a language that's spoken by the Akan of Ghana, West Africa. The meaning of Aquaba is welcome, and that's just a way of welcoming everyone to come and learn and dance and share as part of the festival. This is the 10th anniversary of the Aquaba Dance Festival at Northwest College, and it's the 33rd year of African dance at Houston Community College and I'm the founder of the African Dance Society with the late Deborah Quinnum, who was the first dance teacher at Houston Community College and the person that, made a, that hired full-time dance teachers like Shawnee Henderson that founded the Aquaba Festival. So I'm retiring this year and I'm thrilled that at 69 I can know that my legacy is going on and I can still dance. <laughs> Y así es la rumba, ¿no? 
He says uh, that this, every, this is uh, basically a story of the Cuban people, and it represents to him everything that the Cuban people represent. Happiness, joy, uh, festivities, and celebrating everything that brings him and warms his heart. That's what this represents. Con las dos raíces, sobre todo con la raíz africana. And basically with both races, the African race and the Cuban race. This festival was produced by members of the Center of Excellence for Visual and Performing Arts. Be sure to check it out on our website, hccs.edu. And that's all for this edition of Global Outlook. I'll see you again every Friday and Sunday at 7.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m., plus Saturday at 10 a.m. I'm Mary Sitt. Thanks for watching.